Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Hey guys, welcome back. Today, I'm going to be covering uh, chapter 3, verse 1 in 1 Corinthians. So as you click there in your app or if you're uh, uh, turning there uh, while you do that, I want to kind of recap and summarize the last study we did. Uh, In in chapter 2, as it ends, Paul was talking about the difference between spiritual wisdom and worldly wisdom. Well, now he's going to jump into how it applies in a life. What is a spiritual person? What's a worldly person? And how does that play out in his kingdom? So before we dive in, let me just pray for our time and, uh, and then we'll get started. Father, I need you this morning. It's been a long week and uh, I don't want to get in the way of your work and your words and your will. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen and encourage me uh, during this time, that you would author my thoughts, that you would uh, help me to get out of the way, and that your word would come forth and bring fruit in our lives. Lord, I pray for the people that will watch this. I pray that, Lord, you would uh, work in their lives through this time, that you would shape and mold their hearts, and that you would draw many people unto yourself through your kindness and your goodness. Send your Holy Spirit to teach us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) So, um, (coughs) in this section, Paul is going to share with us the difference between a spiritual leader and and, and how that spiritual um, element in their life plays out throughout uh, all of your life as a Christian. And, and then he, he's going to juxtapose that against uh, a worldly way or uh, living uh, in a way that's, that's not conducive to the Christian walk. And he's going to do that. Obviously, we've been in the book of Corinthians because he has a group of people here <clears throat> that are a, a church that he founded and others have come behind him. And as they've come behind him, they have uh, taught uh, scriptures as well. Now, the problem isn't that these people came in teaching after Paul. The problem is the heart of man in general, is that we as individuals will uh, take a leader and elevate them to places they don't belong. And that's what he's going to get into. So let's dive right in. And and, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, for my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. So what does he mean specifically by spiritual? So today in our context, we often talk about spiritual as kind of a buffet of any belief, right? Well, he or she is spiritual. That could mean a a number of things in this day. Uh, Hey, you know what? They're Buddhist, or they're this, or they're that. Now, Paul has a very distinct word he's using here in the way of spiritual people that actually leaves us with uh, a meaning that's very clear. And it's uh, Paul's using a word that means that they're not allowing God's Spirit to lead them. Clearly, he has uh, a def- definition for spiritual people, and that's that God's Spirit would be leading the individual not our own desires, not our own uh, wants and and, uh, our own flesh. Now, what does he mean by flesh, though? (coughs) Essentially, what he's talking about is that (coughs) they're babes in Christ. It's behavior language. Both sections, by the way, spiritual people, that they're not letting uh, the Holy Spirit lead them That's uh, so there's behavior that is coming out of themselves and not from the spirit. And then uh, in in this word flesh, he's talking about their behavior as well. It's a it's a a drive at more of what they're doing is 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 explaining who they really are. 
and he's trying to drive at that. So <clears throat> don't forget though, that it's easy to say when someone's, a, you know, he says they're babes in Christ. It's easy to look at people that are not uh, walking according to the spirit, but walking according to their flesh and just say, write them off. Hey, you know what? You're not a Christian, but, but Paul doesn't see it that way. You see, Paul uh, knows that <clears throat> these individuals are Christians. How do we know that? Because earlier, what did he say about them? He said that they did not lack in any spiritual gift, right? That they were, uh, they had all speech, all knowledge, that they lacked in no spiritual gifting. These people were filled with the Spirit of God, or they could not do the things that he's claiming. But what they weren't doing is they, they were using it, uh, using the power of the Holy Spirit. They were using him as uh, a means for ministry, but not as a means for personal growth. You, you get that? He, people can operate in a way where they literally are, they're, they're working <clears throat> on others or they're, they're uh, exercising these gifts that God's given them for the betterment of others, but they're not benefiting themselves by their personal growth. And Paul doesn't um, see that as a good thing. We'll go on to see that uh, he says, I gave you milk to drink and not solid food since you weren't ready for it. So he's come in, he shared the gospel and he's laid a foundation. And, and then he gives this, this uh, analogy of, of milk versus solid food. What does he mean by that? Well, the basics or, or the milk part, you know, when a, a mother's nursing their baby, uh, they give them milk because they just can't digest what the, the hard food uh, has in it, right? So, so in the same way, Paul's saying, you guys can't even accept uh, anything other than the basics of what the benefits of God's love are for you. So you, you, you understand the benefits for you. You understand uh, what God can do for you and, and, and his love for you. And, and then juxtapose that, what would be solid food? Well, the solid food is is more than that. It's a deeper devotion to His Spirit having control over your life. And it's leading uh, to sacrificial uh, living for others. Isn't that what Christ did? So if we're to be image bearers of Christ, then maturity looks like we grow towards Him. But Paul's saying, you're nowhere near that. You guys are still having problems. He, <clears throat> he actually says, in fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. What does he mean by worldly? When he's talking about worldly, he's talking about these guys were pursuing the things of the world. They're setting up leaders for themselves and, and, and basing their spirituality on, on who they follow. They're, uh, you know, when, when he goes on to say, for since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? So he gives the clarity what worldly looks like in this case. In this case, these guys were full of envy and strife. Now we know envy is just jealousy of others and what they have or what they do. Um, you know, whether you're at your job and, and someone gets promoted above you, you, you envy them. You, 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 you're, uh, you're jealous of them, right? And doesn't it lead you to a strife or, or uh, a fighting against or an argument? Uh, I just, it, it puts a contentious spirit within you. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. These guys had jealousy of each other and that they were, it was leading them to quarrel and, and fight and, uh, among God's people. And that ought not be. What, what kind of examples do you see in, in the church today where, you know, there's strife, there's jealousy and there's division. You see, I, I know there's a lot of people that have fought over denominations, doctrines, um, you know, to the point where if you're not in my denomination, then you're probably not even really saved, right? If you don't follow my leader, in other words, then you're not even legit. And that's basically what they were saying, right? Now, or how about, uh, why does that person get to do that? Or, uh, you know, because I'm more fill in the blank, spiritual, uh, qualified, um, or I don't do 
this or that action and so therefore I should be able to do that and not this person. Or my favorite uh, is, you know, uh, my, my, my favorite right now is um, how your political views define whether you're a real Christian or not, right? People, oh, he's not a real believer because he's a, he's a Democrat or, or what kind of Republican is he? Because I'm not sure if he would be a real believer if that's the case. And, and so jealousy, you know, reveals something in our heart. What it does is it reveals that essentially I deserve, I think, I deserve more um, than someone else because of uh, I'm better in some way. I've done something right or I've not done something that was wrong, right? And so all of a sudden I'm elevating myself above that person, um, but it also says something about God, not just about yourself and your, your feelings, but it says that basically you believe that God is not in control or he must not be counting correctly or uh, he's not watching, right? He's aloof, but he's not. You know, the problem that they were specifically having is elevating leaders. And so he goes on in verse four and he says, for whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos. Are you not acting like mere humans? What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? They are servants. That word is doulos. It also means slave. They're servants through whom you believed. And each has the role the Lord has given them. That's going to be important. I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. <clears throat> you know, in this area, he's, he's looking at these guys that, that people are elevating, Apollos and, and Paul himself, and he, he's saying, man, you guys have elevated yourself based on our teaching, right? But the reality is, is, is uh, we're just servants. We're mere men. We're not anything special. We've just been doing what God has given us to do. That's it. You know, I, I often think about, you know, how God doesn't really choose um, qualified people to begin with. In one sense, he, he takes an unqualified individual and he, it, it's been said this way. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. So, in other words, I don't, God doesn't need my abilities in my natural being or the, the things that I've gone to school for or all these other uh, techniques that I can learn. He doesn't need that because what he does is he puts his Holy Spirit in me and then what he plans to do, or in us, and then what he plans to do is gift us with the Holy Spirit and his abilities to do things. You know, I, I think of Paul and, um, and Peter. Paul was uh, suited uh, to go to the Jews. He was taught by the Jews. He studied within the Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. We know that this guy was elevated as a very high respected Jew. Wouldn't you send him to the Jews if we were thinking according to man's strategy? But instead, Peter is a Gentile, right? He, he was best suited for going to the Gentiles. Now the Lord goes, sorry, I'm gonna send you to Paul, you're going to go to Gentiles. Peter, you're going to go to the Jews. And I want you to evangelize it. He didn't want them relying on their own strengths. And so he doesn't give us comfort to do that. And that's why these guys understand, hey, I'm just a servant. I'm just given a role and I'm going to do it. You know, we esteem leaders, but God has an upside down kingdom. The first will be last. The last will be first. Matter of fact, why don't we read in uh, Mark 35 through 45 real quick, and we're going to get a good sense for what um, that looks like in God's eyes. What is uh, a servant? So in, uh, again, Mark chapter 10, verse 35, and it starts with this. <clears throat> James and John, the son, sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. That's never a good start or approach to God, 
right? We want you, God, to do what we want. Isn't that putting themselves as God? So that's a really bad starting point. But then they go on and explain what they're looking for. They answered him, allow us to sit at your right and your left in your glory. So they want prominence, they want position, they want power, right? Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> Are you able to drink the cup I drink to be baptized with the baptism in which I will be baptized with? We are able, they told him. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those whom it has been prepared. So God already has a plan. It's already in motion. That's why these guys should understand God has a role. Just follow it, right? And then it says, then the 10 disciples heard this. They began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all over and said to them, stop right there. Notice that the second that you try and elevate yourself, everybody else gets jealous. This is exactly the scenario that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians. And this is, this is where the best clarification comes where Jesus really gives us an understanding of how he sees leadership and elevation of anybody. You know, he says, that you are regarded as rulers of the Gentile and they lord over them. Uh, sorry, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. Even For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, right off the bat, guys, we see that the Lord's clear. He's saying... If you want to be great, you got to become a servant. Not try and elevate yourself above people, but try and serve below people. That's what I mean by an upside down kingdom. You see, in this world, we strive and, and fight and, and scrape and do everything we can, cheat, lie and steal to get to the top. And then you have to strive to maintain that. And the Lord says, I got a different way. And this is part of what he described earlier, that it's foolishness to man. Why? Because they, they know only one system. And, and God says, no, no, no. If you want to be great in, in the kingdom of heaven, lower yourself now. Serve the way I served. That's what he did. He came at the end. It said he came to be, not to be served, but to serve. Right? And so, so these guys aren't getting that. These guys are, are living in a fashion that does not reflect the one that they claim to follow. So they're still following their own worldly desires. They're, they're still pursuing uh, worldly pursuits. You know, <clears throat> he goes on to say in verse seven, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Okay, so God is responsible for the outcome is what Paul's giving us here. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. We play our part. We do our role. We serve others. And then the rest of it, as far as the outcome, that's up to God. It's really up to him. He creates growth. He creates increase. We're just supposed to do our part. One waters, one plants. That's it. Well, let's... Let's take a look and read uh, 1 Corinthians in uh, chapter 12. In verse 12, there's a, uh, a clear picture of what it looks like to be unified as a body of believers and not torn apart like he's talking here. So let's look at that. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all parts of the, that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and 
We are all given one spirit to drink. So notice, no matter where you come from, no matter what your education, no matter what your background, no matter what your ethnicity, you were all the same in God's eyes. We're, we're on a level playing field. He says, indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for any, if it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts of the body just as He wants. Notice we don't get to choose our position. He chooses it for us. But He's designed you. He's designed me. He knows exactly how we're made and how we've uh, become who we are. When he decides to use you, he has his own plans and his own power. He doesn't need um, us to have something to bring to the table, just to do what he wants. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. Notice this. This is a really upside down kingdom he's about to explain. And those parts of the body that are considered less honorable, maybe serving other people behind the scenes, you're not able to preach, so you're stacking chairs, that type of person. We clothe these with greater honor and our unrespectable parts are treated with great respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body. Notice, God's plan to keep division from the body is, if I give you a position in this world where you're speaking and you're a forefront type of guy, uh, like for instance, what I'm doing, I'm preaching and there's 2,000 people that watched a video just last week. I'm getting some accolades and all these sorts of things from people. But the reality is God says, hey, just to balance things out, those people that aren't getting that, I'm going to make sure that they receive a reward in heaven that balances things out. It may not be now, maybe later, maybe now, just not in that moment. So, but God will bring honor to those that were hidden behind the scenes. He'll balance it out. But <clears throat> that the member would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, the individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. So he goes on and he gives a list of, of different positions and things that, um, that we do, right? So we do the work of the ministry. And we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, to change us, to help us understand that we are unified. We're all one part, even though we have individual things to do, right? He goes on and he says, uh, and each will receive his own reward according to his labor, his own labor. Now, I know a lot of people would jump in and go, well, isn't that works uh, related like entry into heaven? Like, no, 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 no. First off, God's fair, and He values, basically, He values all of us the same, but we're going to be rewarded according to the work done through us by the Holy Spirit, okay? So when He says that we're, re we're rewarded according to our own labor, for each, uh, for we are God's co-workers, you are God's field and building. 
God desires to make sure that he's a fair individual, which means every one of us are offered opportunities to co-join with God in his efforts to bring the kingdom here to earth, right? To, to love people and share his good uh, news, his message, his gospel. And sometimes we lean into that, sometimes we don't. And so God has this way of making sure that, hey, as you submit to me and you allow me to work through you, I'm going to reward you for that. And yes, you'll always be a part of the body. You are a believer, but some are more active in allowing the Holy Spirit to work through them and some are not. And so in that, there's reward for what you do. Now don't forget, you will also be given crowns and you'll set them at Jesus' feet because you know it wasn't really you. You were just like Paul saying, I, I've got a role that I've been given and I'm a servant. I'm just supposed to do what God wants me to do. It's funny that God rewards you for the things he will do through you. So, in this case, maybe, <clears throat> you know, the guy who, or gal who um, feels less honored, the one that, you know, uh, let's say you're a mouthpiece now. Maybe you're going to be a dishwasher in heaven. Or the guy who's picking up trash now might be leading the class on how to serve later. Right? He'll balance things out and make things fair. He goes on in, in verse 10, he says, According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. Don't forget, Paul reminds us at the end of this, don't forget that it's all by grace. It's by grace. You know, if, if I was left to myself, I would not be doing God's will. If it was up to my desires and, and if I didn't have the grace of God uh, pointing me in a direction every day and, and allowing me to realize that I'm here for His purposes, what would end up happening? I would end up continuing in pursuing the things of this world. And the reality is, I've got to be honest with you guys. His grace has saved me in so many ways. I, I've... I would naturally turn back to sin and darkness if I didn't have His grace to continue forward. Most of the time I'm praying, I'm praying for the grace to continue in what He's called me to. You know, uh, I think it's probably best to share a bit of the last two years. It really explains how God has been faithful, even though Normally, any other person would pull out and, and run from him. You see, <clears throat> if you have followed my story, you know a bit of this. But if you haven't, I want to share it with you. Basically, over the uh, about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, um, I had a major, major, major breakdown. And uh, I got to a place where I was depressed. I was cracking at the seams. I, 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 I didn't know how to handle life. And... And I was basically at a point where I was uh, ready to take my life. I thought that I was useless. And God, one day by the river, literally contemplating suicide, the Lord said, I'm not done with you. I just heard this soft, still voice in my, in my heart just say, I'm not done with you. And, and that was a bit of His grace telling me, I have purpose. In the moment, I was thinking I didn't have purpose. And, and he spoke softly a, a couple words and it gave purpose again. That was grace. And, and then I, <clears throat> I started to ask, well, then in, in a very sarcastic, very hurt, very damaged way, well, then what do you want, Lord? I wasn't, oh, Lord, I'm all yours. No, I was, I was broken and I was jacked and I was pissed at him. I didn't understand him. I thought... Like, you know, where are you? Are you not watching what's going on? A number of things were happening that didn't look like God was watching. Like, like the enemy was winning or God wasn't keeping score. And then what God did is just slowly, by mercy and grace and His kindness that leads us to repentance, 
He started to operate in my life in a way where he gave me more and more desire to turn back to him. I wasn't naturally wanting to. I was ready to run. But he drew me back in with his kindness and his love. He got me back to, well, he's getting me back to healthy physically. Um, I'm a lot better than I was. I was dealing with a lot of ailments. Um, I just, I needed God to draw me in. And over that time, what happened? He says, hey, what, what I had for you to do is to preach. You know, prior to that, I had 15-ish years, 17 years of failed ministry, if you will. It was a, a long, rough road of rejection and failures and, and trials. And then God starts to say, no, I got a purpose for your life. He uses grace to give us the strength to do what we need to do through His Spirit. And He gives us grace to enter into His kingdom. You don't come on your own merit, ever. And so, I want to invite you as we close today to accept His grace, unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. I was clearly ready for um, the opposite. I was turning my fist at him and, and in anger. And he turned his heart towards me in that moment. How are you doing? Where are you at with God? You got some anger issues? Maybe some past hurts? I can assure you that if you just take a second and talk to him. God, where have you been? Are you not watching? He's a big boy. He can handle all the language you throw at him. He can handle all the frustration. Be real with him. He already knows what's going on in your heart. And a sincere heart, he won't turn away. So, let me pray for you. And if this is you, you're in that circumstance, like I was a year and a half ago, I wanna pray that you would turn to him have a conversation with him. Allow him to speak back to you. Sit quietly and listen. Lord, I pray for the people that will watch this video, the people that will need your grace, Lord, in ways they didn't understand or know, and, and now they've been awakened to it through your word. Lord, I pray that you would give them that grace, turn their hearts. Lord, show them your love. I pray that you would reveal that the enemy's been lying to them. And you're not mad at them. You don't hate them. You gave your son 2,000 years ago before they even sinned, you decided to cover them by grace. Lord, draw people back into your body that once were here and wandered off or Lord, people that have been fighting and striving uh, through jealousy, Lord. I pray that you would heal their hearts and reveal your path of servanthood for them. Show us, Lord, how to be more like you. Continue to grow us by your spirit. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name and by your authority, Lord. Thank you for the righteousness you appointed to each of us who accept it. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us back next week. We're going to pick right up where we left off, and uh, I look forward to being with you guys next week. Love you.